As we begin today, I just want to thank Kathy for her word to us uh, as we step into living generously in community. Um, Kathy, that was truly beautiful um, as you called us all into this month um, of generosity, so thank you. Will you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. The word generous is a word that has evolved since its earliest origin. The Latin word generosus means of noble birth, and when it came around and was found in the language in the 14th and 15th century, that's what it was about. Through the 16th century, most recorded English used the word generous and reflecting there upon the aristocrats, uh, the sense of being noble or in high birth, in high lineage. To be generous was literally a way of saying to belong to nobility. During the 17th century, however, something begins to shift. The meaning and the use of the word begin to change. Generosity increasingly comes to be identified not as literal family heritage, not as noble birth, but a nobility of the spirit through which one is associated with the qualities they carry, not high birth. And so those admirable qualities then vary from person to person depending on whether a person possesses the qualities they could be called generous. Did a person possess the qualities and traits of what others would say is actual nobility, that is, gallantry and courage, strength and richness, gentleness and fairness? If so, they're generous. Into the 18th century and continuing to our times, the meaning of generosity continues to evolve in a direction denoting more specifically open-handedness, open-heartedness and liberality and giving of money and possessions, of kindness shared with others. From defining elite nobility, the word we inherit today reflects admirable personal quality traits and actions which anyone can do and can be reflected in any life, any spirit, the best of the human spirit. Any person anywhere can live by a spirit of generosity. It has nothing to do with what you have in your pocket or your bank account. To be called a generous person, in my belief, is one of the greatest compliments that someone can pay because they show the best qualities of the human spirit, giving with an overflowing heart of love. As Christians, to be generous is to be conformed not just to Christ, but also to the divine and loving parent. God in heaven, whose sacrificial self-gift into the world makes possible human fellowship in the divine life. Remember these words from John. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So there's this tie of generosity to eternity. The Apostle Paul regarded generosity as expressed in the gifts of other Christian churches in the Jerusalem, as, as opposed to the Jerusalem church in some ways, as proof of the genuine character of Christian love. For Paul, this love is exemplified by Christ, who, though he was rich, yet for your sake became poor, in 2 Corinthians. Generosity involves giving beyond one's means, though Paul also notes that those now giving out of their abundance may find themselves at some point in need. And the beauty of the Christian family is we're always given to that love for one another that if you have the resources at one point but need the resources at another, you share across the board. You help each other in your need. The evolution of generosity gives me tremendous hope. Generosity's evolution gives me extra special hope because I have witnessed it here as your pastor. It shows in the words that you have, in the actions that you take. I have seen generous and inclusive lives emerge. To be generous is a form of true genius in my mind. I have seen this genius at work right here at First Church. 
I have seen it in our staff. I have seen it in our membership. I have seen it and witnessed generous people step up and share themselves in ways that I never imagined possible. They stepped up in times when we had the greatest need, and they didn't hesitate to step in and help, to make a difference with their time, their talents, and their treasure. Last week, you're sitting together over there, last week we all felt it at the 171st anniversary picnic. The genius of generosity was that along with Quan and the others who planned it, we were in the canopy of trees that we have in the back, and we were cool. I mean, we're always kind of cool if Wendy and Susie are leading us, but I mean, we were cool, cool, <laughs> so, because we were together, and you felt it in the space that we were celebrating. You all felt it. You all brought that generosity of spirit and food. I have seen people openly open their daily planners, some in, you know, in their, in their, in their um, you know, devices, some in hand forms, open their servants' toolkits and their wallets and pocketbooks and share of themselves in evolving ways during times of need. I see us growing and living more and more each and every day as a community of generous people. As one of your pastors, I can tell you it is a beautiful sight to behold. I have watched a growing number of you step up and step into community in brand new ways. Then I have seen you step out to share God's love with others. It is powerful to behold how generosity evolves in our living, breathing community of faith. It takes over the heart. And as I've seen among you through these days and through these years, you are witnesses in the lives that you live of generosity, and you share that with so many in so many ways. The scripture guides us as we live generously, generously in community. In Matthew's gospel today, we hear Jesus talking about two children. In this vignette, a father needs help in the vineyard. When he sends his children, one of them commits the unthinkable offense of openly defying his father, an attitude tantamount to defying that he's not actually your father at all. So you're saying, I'm not gonna go to work, is saying you're not even my father. The least respectful you can be in any imaginable way in the time it was delivered. The Greek word actually translates sons, not, it's, it's not sons that it translates, it translates children, so we're not sure of the gender. We just use son, but it's not necessarily gender specific. The second child responds with great formal respect, but then does nothing to satisfy the father's needs. Obviously, neither child acts rightly or well. One defies the father, the other replies politely and then renders the words meaningless. Then Jesus says that the disrespectful child has a change of mind, is the Greek word that is used here in this. The phrase is not insignificant. It is metamelome, metamelome, which means a deep emotion, an adjustment of a person's basic properties. In other words, and priorities, excuse me. So the person changes the absolute way that they're doing something, like metanoia. It's a change of heart and mind. This change implies refocusing values, <coughs> internalizing the father's request, a course of action that effectively reverses the original insolent, not your child, in response. The people who replied to Jesus' question had to swallow very hard before saying which child did the Father's will. How could they say that a child who acted disrespectfully as the one who was in the right? They're trapped. Jesus traps them once again. Meanwhile, you've got Paul's letter to the Philippians that casts an unexpected light on the gospel. When St. Paul calls his community to allow Christ's mind to be active in them, he refers to both attitudes and actions. Christ's mindset leads him to ignore the status often attributed to God, the sort of prestige that would allow him to do whatever he wanted. Christ Jesus presents himself to us as the anti-celebrity, the servant's son who reveals that God is not like 
what we might like God to be like. Jesus reveals a God who waits, who waits for people to come around and to internalize the divine will, no matter how long it takes or how much they may resist that way. It appears that God prefers scandal to lip service. Now back to Jesus' question. What if the answer to his question was, both children did the Father's will, at least a little bit? Neither was an ideal child. One made a display of proper respect, but never in, embodies the verbal devotion indeed. The other gives the appearance of being sacrilegious, but carries out the Father's will. Each child leaves room for change. Jesus reveals a God who waits for each one to come around to internalizing the divine will, no matter how long it takes and no, how, no matter how much they resist. This is the Jesus solution of waiting, waiting in the spirit of God. And it may not satisfy any of us. We may come away feeling that's not good enough. That's not the way to be. Some of us want to cling to respect while others demand action. And we may find ourselves dissatisfied with this Jesus way as he exposes the incompleteness of understanding what God's will is. Then Paul invites us to take a closer look, to take a look into the mind and spirit of Christ, to take a look at the one who would lay down his life on the cross for us without digging in, without defending his own self-interest, just gives himself to us. Remember, God is always calling us to metanoia. God is always calling us to change of heart and mind that opens us to see things from another person's perspective and to be more generous in the way we approach them. God is always calling us to live generously in community. In that spirit, let us turn our hearts and minds to God, to God's table of grace, and join with our sisters and brothers, all the children of God across the globe who are coming to the table today with open hearts and open minds. Amen.